Well, good evening. Hope everybody's had a great day. I hope worship went well this morning. We had a really good uh, family get together. We haven't participated in since COVID, so it was good. But we're happy to be back here this evening. Hope everybody had a great afternoon as well. We're going to start on the hymn book, the red hymn book, page 252. 252 redeemed, and welcome those alive online as well. <laughs> passing out the communion? I got the communion. Well, I do. Mama needs it, Paul needs it, and Lola? No, no. I got it. Yeah. All right, and to thank you. Yeah. And you made it for the word doctor. Right on, son. It's good to see you. Oh, you have a week? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time as we get to come around your table, the Lord's table, and remember what your son Jesus Christ did for us. Let us remember the bread represents his body and the juice represents his shed blood. In Jesus' name. Two 
261. 261. Love looked at me. Last night it was cooled down quite a bit. 
Uh, all right, so it's a blessing to have you home. Yeah. Keep take keep Frank. Keep Frank from New York, Matt. Yeah. Uh, enjoying it. It's really good yeah. having it's really good to have you back home to and, by and, the way. And, and we get prairie because I think we're looking for a place to live. Uh it's oh. just temporary where I'm staying at. Yeah. Well, hopefully it's still in town because we'd love to see It'd you be here. in town. Yeah. yeah. Good. 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 All right. Susie. You had a good sermon. You had a good sermon today, too. Good. Yes. Jared Grimm. Yep. And I you get to catch up on that yeah. later on this week. So that's great. Jenny. I will be traveling. My daughter Penny's going to be driving me to uh, Salem on Tuesday. My cousin Jean Ferguson that passed away with uh, Parkinson and cancer uh, at the memorial service and uh, um, celebration of life will be Tuesday. So we're back. All right, let's be with Jenny and Penny as they travel to the service this upcoming week for a celebration of life. How's Bob today? He's doing fine. He's, he's um, not walking yet, but tomorrow for physical therapy exam, I'm going to be in charge, so I'm going to tell him what I, what I want to do. So. All right, <laughs> sounds good. And the ramp that Steve Hilton made for the wheelchair is beautiful, perfect, and, and we appreciate it so much. All right, well, thanks, Steve, for helping out with that, and looking forward for Bob being home, too, and home with us here. So, any other great praises or prayer requests? I found out that Charity McCauley broke her shoulder. Yeah. Charity McCauley broke her shoulder. We saw her today with the family, so she needs some prayers. All right, any others? Adeline's child. Lois. Any updates on Lois? She was here Wednesday. She was here Wednesday, okay. Let's be with Lois. By the way, thank you for coming this year to the rally and your family. When are you guys traveling back home? We'll be praying for your travels. And thank you again. It was a great, awesome experience of having you here with us. So thank you. All right. Any other announcements, prayer requests that are not in the bulletin? Okay. So I know we just finished up the rally. But with a show of hands, and I participate too, we have enough people, like we did last year. This Tuesday, I'm at 4.30 and walking from 5 to 7 is a walk for life. And if anybody wants to participate in that, um, let me know, raise your hand, or we can talk afterwards and see if we can form. David? Yeah. Well, if I'm not working at your house, I'll be there. Okay, so... We're, we're committed to going? Yep. Okay, I'll go, and whoever would like to join, Steve, okay? I'm going to try. Okay, that'd be great. So the Walk for Life is a fundraiser for people that are walking for young mothers that are challenged to make other choices instead of abortion. So we have a whole bunch of other churches that help participate, and it's a fundraiser for a great agency. Yes, Ted? Did I miss the rally? Yeah. Just but if you have online access or YouTube, you can watch it on there as well. On YouTube, sometimes this week, I have to download it. <laughs> but anybody, if they would like to participate, sounds like we have a few. Um, it's a great cause to help out, and we're with other churches as well. And then on Wednesdays is Ladies Quilting Day. It's inspiration is the last Sunday of every month. Sunday School for Kids, by the way, it's great to have kids here this week. Oh, it's been a long time, and great. everyone just cherished it. Oh, and yeah. uh, it was great to have Erica and those help out with, uh, with activities for the kids as well, so thank you. Men's Breakfast every last Saturday of every month from 9 a.m. at Dishners. They will say a prayer, and Bob will be better by then. That's no problem. <laughs> And uh, what's that? We need a ride for that too. Okay, maybe we could figure out how to talk to your caregiver or something like that, Ted. Okay, I'll talk to the caregiver. And he's welcome to come too. I mean, I don't yeah. think he'll turn down I'll breakfast. Ask him. I'll ask him. 
Yeah. I like when we leave. So take your bulletin and then show them that, and it says that missionaries, okay? All right. All right. Ladies choir practice until September. until September. Sounds good. And let's see, today is the 6th. And you all did birthdays. And uh, looks like Dory has a birthday coming up. Prudence is coming up. Did they sing happy birthday to you, kid? And Carrie has a birthday. March 6th. Huh? March 6th. March 6th is your birthday. All right. I'll be 70 years old. Really? Congratulations. You look more younger than that, Ted. Yeah. You're doing really good, by the way. Yeah. Thank you. Bob and Jenny will have their anniversary coming up as well, and Dave and Rosemary. All right, any other prayer requests or announcements? Okay, at this time, I'll have Derek come on up. Well, with everything going on this week, uh, I didn't get tonight's message finished. I got this morning's messages done, though. I did this morning. So tonight, uh, you're going to get an old one, but um, it, it's far enough back that maybe you won't remember it. There you go. <laughs> I, I picked one from my, my first uh, few months here, so, so maybe uh, kind of like... I don't know about you guys, but in our family, we watch a movie. After a couple of years, it's it's brand new again. Right. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we're gonna be at Matthew 25 tonight. Say it again, please. Matthew 25. Matthew 25. Father, we thank you so much for everything that you are to us. Such a great week, all the messages we've heard from your word, and um, so many different speakers, and just how you use all different kinds of personalities, and um, Lord, we just we thank you how we've been blessed this week, and um, we come once again before you, and we want to honor you, and honor your word, and uh, we just pray that your spirit touch us this evening and uh, and just teach us something that we need to hear, Lord. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Is there something wrong with the mic? It was short and we were going to have to fix it, but you want me to use the red one? Yeah, let's use that. Okay. Ready now. All right. Matthew 25, starting in verse 1. At that time, the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones took their lamps but did not take any oil with them. The wise ones, however, took oil in jars along with their lamps. The bridegroom was a long time in coming, and they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, the cry rang out, Here's the bridegroom, come out to meet him. When all the virgins woke up, trimmed their lamps, the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. No, they replied, there may not be enough for both us and you, instead go to those who sell oil and buy some for yourselves. The while they were on their way by the oil, the bridegroom arrived, and the virgins who were ready went in with them to the wedding banquet, and the door was shut. Later the others also came, 
Lord, Lord, they said, open the door for us. But he replied, truly I tell you, I do not know you. Therefore keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. History as we know it is going to come to an end. Um, in the previous chapter, in Matthew 24, verse 30, Jesus said, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn, when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the heavens to the other. Jesus describes his return, and he speaks of it as a day, you know, which will cause both mourning for unbelievers, but great joy for those of us who are his. And this is what we as Christians have believed for 2,000 years now. But one day, perhaps a day, he'll come back to judge the living and the dead. And uh, chapters 24 and 25 of Matthew are, are really all about this. And he's encouraging his disciples, you know, how they ought to live in the light of his coming. That period of time between his first coming and his second coming. And this return, it's going to be physical, visible, unmistakable, unmistakable return. Every eye will behold him coming. And it will be suddenly, and it will be unexpectedly. In verse 37 of 24, Jesus said, As it was in the days of Noah, so will it be of the coming of the Son of Man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking and giving in marriage up to the day that Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at a hand mill, one will be taken and the other left. Therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. It's going to be a day that will happen all of a sudden, it will be unexpected, and there will be this great divide between all people on that day. And uh, the, the consistent application of these, these chapters here in Matthew and uh, these parables that Jesus gives is that we need to be prepared. We should live out our lives, you know, with this expectancy that Christ is going to return. And the final judgment of God in eternity, you know, which will follow, uh, it will all come at a time when we're not expecting it. Uh, as one of the, the speakers this week said, it would be like a thief in the night, and he's not going to give you a postcard telling you he's coming. So keep watch, uh, for you don't know when the Lord will come. So earlier, um, Jesus' disciples, they wanted to know the time concerning the second coming. And that's how people still are to this day, you know. When is he going to come? And they try and figure it out. But Jesus told them then, and it's still true now, no one knows the day or hour. He said, not the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. And then uh, later he repeated again, he said, therefore, keep watch because you don't know on what day the Lord will come. And then finally, he repeats it a third time in the parable just before this one. He said, the master of that servant will come on the day when he does not expect him in the hour that he's not aware. So over and over again, you know, the Lord says, I'm coming at a time you're not going to expect it. Perhaps today. I had a Bible professor uh, who would uh, go to the window every morning and he would say, perhaps today, Lord, perhaps today. You know, no one knows it's going to be sudden, it's going to be unexpected. And one of the main points of this parable is to teach us all that, that suddenness, that unexpectedness of the second coming. And it's, it's also teaching us to be prepared 
so that we're ready at the moment of any day, of any week, of any year. Verse 1 starts out, at that time. At what time? While Jesus was just talking about the faithful servant and the wicked servant, in that parable, in that parable he emphasized again this idea that he would come when the servant wouldn't, wouldn't expect it. Uh, now, the, the first time that Jesus came, the world wasn't ready for him, was it? They should have been, but they weren't. You know, the prophets gave us a lot of things to look for. They prophesied about the coming of John the Baptist. Uh, they prophesied that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, that he would be born of a virgin, that he would be born from the tribe of Judah, and many, many, many more prophecies. That he would come to Galilee and uh, all these prophecies, and yet when he came, they didn't recognize him. Well, Jesus says in this parable that uh, <clears throat> there's going to be a second coming and we need to be ready for it. We don't know when it's coming, but we need to be ready. Now, when we read this, you know, we recognize, first of all, that there's a whole lot of cultural differences, right? When, when we read the story about the ten virgins, we're trying to figure out what in the world's going on here. And the, the, way, the way that we do weddings today is completely different. You know, for us in America, uh, the whole thing kind of centers around the bride, right? And how she looks and the bride coming down the aisle. And when she does come down the aisle, you know, everybody stands up when the bride appears. But we don't pay too much attention to the bridegroom. He's kind of in the back corner somewhere. <laughs> but back in the first century, it was all focused on the bridegroom. Now, this wedding that Jesus describes, it was a, it was a typical wedding in those days. And everybody got involved. You know, it was a great day of celebration and happiness. It was a great social event, but long before the engage, uh, before the marriage came the engagement, and that was actually an official contract between the two fathers. And this would happen sometimes when uh, the couple were just kids. Sometimes this was even done by uh, an official matchmaker. Um, you ever watch the fiddle on the roof? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so that kind of thing went on, and, and sometimes, you know, the couple never met each other before. Sometimes they knew each other their whole lives. Uh, and then after that, uh, there was this betrothal. And this was kind of this official ceremony about a year before the, the couple actually got married. And it was very much like the, the wedding itself, because all the family and all the friends, they would participate um, in this, and the, the couple, they would make vows, they would make promises to each other, and it was a big deal. Now, and Johanna and I actually did this, uh, because that's how they do it in Romania, too, just like they did it back in uh, the days in the Bible. So, our engagement, our betrothal, was in July in Romania, and then we were married in the States in, uh, in February of that next year. But this, this engagement, this betrothal, it took several hours. It was an all-day thing. There was over 300 people that showed up. And uh, first, we greeted everybody you know, when they arrived. And then there was this official ceremony where I had to put the engagement ring on her in front of hundreds of witnesses. <laughs> and her dad performed uh, the ceremony. And we made our vows to each other. I had to memorize some scriptures and we had to say them in front of each other. And then we go downstairs and we had the, the first course of uh, a meal. And then uh, after we stuffed our faces, then we went back upstairs. And it was time for the audience to participate because they get the whole audience involved. And um, anybody that wants to, and they encourage everybody to do it, but they would come up uh, in groups of families, usually, sometimes just one or two, but, and they would either say something nice to us, sing us a song, read a poem, something to that effect. 
And this takes a whole lot of time when you have 300 people. Uh, so so we, we would do a few of them, and then we'd go back downstairs, and we'd eat some more, and we'd get the second course. And then we'd go back upstairs, and they'd do some more. And this went on all day. Uh, and then by the end of the day, I was starting to get tired, because we got up really early that day, too. And, and we had to sit up here. We were on the stage, so everybody was looking at us. And uh, I started to nod off, and Mahana kept bumping me. <laughs> so, you know, and this was, cultures are very different. This was just our engagement. Usually in America, it's a private thing just between you and the person that you're asking to marry. But it was really nice, and it was something nice to share with everybody. Got to be a part of it, and I'll always remember it. But... Um, so this is, this is how they do engagements and, and betrothals in other countries. It, it was very serious and it was a very binding thing because uh, before everyone uh, left, you know, at, at our engagement party, they all, a lot of them anyway, came up to me, they'd shake their finger in my face and they'd say, you better take care of her or I'll come hunt you down. Oh, dear. <laughs> oh. And so, especially back in, in, uh, in Israel in the first century, you know, the betrothal was very binding. And if you broke the betrothal, it was actually like getting a divorce. And if your husband died, you know, during the betrothal period, before you were even married, it was considered, you were considered a widow. Uh, even if you hadn't been married, and you weren't living together or anything, but it was considered that you were a widow. So... Then after this betrothal, about a year later, um, or I mean for about a year or so, the man would leave after the, the betrothal, and he would go and build a home and get things ready, you know, for the, the wedding. Um, he had to provide a place for him and his wife, and a lot of times, you know, they just built their own homes in those days, and he would do all, everything that was necessary for when the actual ceremony of the wedding would come. And then came the wedding ceremony and the wedding celebration and everything is ready and he's prepared his home for her. And now, you know, he would go to the home uh, of his bride-to-be. She would probably still be living with her parents. And he would bring her back to the, this new home. And there would be this great procession. You would, they would go through the streets, through all the neighborhoods, and all kinds of people would join in this procession. And uh, they would visit different places along the way. And when they finally reached the bridegroom's home, then there was this huge wedding. And that would last for seven days. And uh, then they would, uh, they would shut the door. And once it was shut, nobody could enter. But the, the bride and groom, you know, they wouldn't be alone until everyone had left the wedding feast. So you got married, but you had to wait seven days until all the people left. <laughs> well, the, the focus of this parable here is about the, the ten virgins who were waiting for the bridegroom to join in the procession. And they were the ones that were supposed to provide the light because, you know, this is back before electricity. And if you're going to have this procession, you know, through the streets at night, they had to have some light. So these ten virgins, they were, they were lighting the way for everybody. So it says they took their lamps and uh, that they had in their homes. And the Greek word here means torch. So it's not the same word that Jesus uses, like when he talks about don't hide your light under a bushel. Oh no, you know. It's not that light. It's not the little the little lamp that they used to have. No, this is the same word that was used for the, the Roman soldiers, you know, when they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And it was a long wooden pole, and it had wires and uh, rags at the end of it, you know, and they were soaked in oil uh, to light the way of this uh, procession. And they would carry a little a jar of oil so that they could keep it as long as it needed to be lit. So here are the, the ten virgins, and they're waiting for the, the bridegroom with their lamps. They don't know when he's coming, so they just have to be ready. And the reason why it says virgins is because, you know, 
In those days, if you were a married girl, you were a virgin. And they were like friends, relatives of the, the married couple. And it was an honor, you know, if you were chosen to be one of the virgins. And it was, uh, it was a very special and important job, you know, that they were given to do. Now, it's obvious from this parable who those ten virgins are. Uh, as far as we're concerned and the connection that Jesus is trying to make. They're, they're the ones who claim uh, to belong to Christ and they're waiting for Christ's return. Christ is our bridegroom. And, uh, you know, they all appear to be the same. They've all been invited. They've all been called to participate in this wedding. And they've all, you know, initially positively responded to the wedding. All ten of them attended uh, the bride at the beginning, and it began well. All ten of them had lamps, which at first did give light. And their presence shows that they are interested. So the connection today is like, you know, there's a lot of people, they come to church, they sing and worship, they bring their Bibles, on the outside, they all appear to be the same. And it's hard to distinguish them from the true believers, right? The, the false Christians are sitting beside the true Christians. And they all seem to be interested in Christ. Except the text makes the distinction for us. It says five of them are wise and five are, well, the word is moros, which we get the English word moron from. Foolish. And so it's something, you know, that the human eye can't distinguish. But God knows because he searches our hearts. God knows our character. God knows whose are his. And uh, the, the, the foolish, they took the lamps, but they didn't take enough extra oil with them. But the wise, they took along extra oil. And the foolish five, they didn't have endurance. That was their problem, you know. They, they weren't prepared for the long haul. They weren't concerned about the future. Now, if the bridegroom could, would have come back right away, they would have been okay. But they had no endurance. They had no extra oil to fill their lamps. But the wise were watchful and they anticipated Maybe there's going to be a delay. And the foolish, they're kind of like those in, in the parable of the four soils. Remember, the, the seed was planted, and the plant that comes up, it flourishes at first, right? It appears like the, good, the ones that were in the good soil. But it says they didn't have any depth. It says they believed for a while, but in times of testing, they fall away. Or they're like the other seeds that fell among the thorns. They hear the word, and they grow up too, but the, the worries of life, the deceitfulness of wealth, the desires for, every, for other things come in and choke them. And so while they started out well, they also perished along the way. It's also like Jesus' parable about the weed tares. You know, they, they look so much alike, we don't want to start pulling them up, but we might pull out the wheat. So we wait for the Lord's coming. And at the end, the Lord will be the one that makes the distinction. And you know, the, the church across the world is filled with people who are unprepared for the coming of the Lord. And it's not just one of the ten virgins that wasn't prepared, right? How many in the parable weren't prepared? Half of them, right? Now, it might not be half of the church, per se, but it's a large number. And it's a common problem in the church at large. There are those who Paul warns about in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 5. He says, they have a form of godliness, but without power. Their faith is what James talks about, a faith without deeds, and therefore it's a dead faith. Now it says that all ten fell asleep. 
Uh, usually people are excited at the thought of a wedding, that they can't sleep much the, the night before. I know I didn't sleep much the night before my wedding. I've never heard of anyone that was getting married to oversleep, but maybe it's happened, who knows. But there wasn't anything wrong with her falling asleep, because all ten, it says, fall asleep. The wise and the foolish. But you shouldn't fall asleep if you're not prepared. That's the thing. You need to be prepared that if someone wakes you up, you're ready to go. And you can't neglect these windows of opportunity and sleep through them. So one of the things this parable teaches, uh, besides just being prepared, is that we should expect a delay. And, you know, people have often mocked the, the second coming of Christ because of this delay, right? In fact, even in the first century, this idea of his return was being mocked, right? Because one of the writers of the New Testament actually addresses it, Peter does. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, Scoffers will come scoffing, saying, Where is this Jesus that you've been talking about who is to come back? Well, these parables, they teach us that expect a delay. It's been 2,000 years. Every generation says, oh, it's got to be our generation. I just know it. I just know it. I mean, you can read old books, and that's mm -hmm. what we'll say. It has to be. The world's so evil, and this was back in 1950 or something, you know. The world's so evil. Well, that's what we're saying now, right? But who knows? It might be a couple hundred years out. We don't know. But earlier in uh, chapter 24, verse 14, the, the wicked servant says, My master is staying away a long time. And in the, in the next parable, it says, After a long time, the master of the servant returned. And here again in chapter 25, the bridegroom was a long time in coming. So Jesus taught us that there, there would be a delay, but it was definitely coming back, and so that we should not be surprised that 2,000 years have passed, because that's what he predicted. But make sure that you keep watching. You don't say, well, it's been 2,000 years, he hasn't come yet, it probably will come for two more thousand. He might come tomorrow. So we just always need to be ready. We don't know the day or hour. And then in verse 6, it says, At midnight there was a cry. At the darkest hour of the night, when no one expects you know, the wedding to start, I mean, who would expect the wedding to start? You know, at three in the morning or whatever. Nobody would expect that. But that's exactly what happened when he comes. In Matthew 24, 27, it says, As lightning flashes from the east to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. You know, what's more awful and sudden than lightning in this still black sky? When Christ returns, you know, it's going to be a very dark time spiritually. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3, uh, the world will be crying peace and safety. And then suddenly destruction will come upon them as a pregnant woman who suddenly goes into labor and they will not escape. Luke 18, 8 says, When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? The bridegroom uh, had a very startling effect upon these virgins. They were, they were shocked. They were surprised. And for the five wives, you know, that was the moment that uh, begins the wedding. Full of joy. They were, they were excited. It was a time of blessing and fellowship and it was a time of happiness, and it finally arrived, and they were ready to go. But for the foolish five, the realization had set in that they weren't ready. You know, maybe they thought, well, I can just go quickly and get some more oil. But they weren't thinking he'd come in the middle of the night. 
when all the stores are closed and you couldn't get the oil. Or maybe they just weren't thinking at all, right? But suddenly everything is revealed and they can't light their lamps. And so the, the foolish turn to the wise and they say, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. And they said, no, or there may not be enough for me and you. There will be an alarming discovery, you know, when Jesus comes and the truth of things are going to be revealed. The hidden things are going to come to light. And every man will see himself exactly as he is, and everyone's faith has to be their own. You can't borrow someone else's faith. Salvation isn't transferable. Every person must have his own salvation. Every person must make his own life right before God. He can't get baptized for someone else or share in their faith. You can't grab the arm of the person next to you and hope you can just tag along into heaven. No, if your parents were Christians or your spouse is a Christian, that doesn't mean you get in by association. No, you're going to be judged by you and you alone whether you're part of the wise or the foolish. But the good news is the oil is available right now, but it won't be at midnight when Jesus comes back. Now, there's so many people who are unprepared to face God, and they're deceived about it, you know. They, and in a moment when they face the truth about everything, it's going to be too late. And while the, the foolish five went out to buy oil at the last minute, you know, the bridegroom arrived. And the five who were ready, you know, they went into the bridegroom's house to enjoy the wedding feast. And then the door was shut. And when the foolish five finally arrived, they knocked and said, open the door for us. But he replied, I tell you the truth, I do not know you. And if you're not prepared to meet the Lord, you will be shut out of heaven. The door of heaven is wide open right now. It's been wide open for a long time. But when Christ appears, you know, which could be any moment, it's going to be shut. And all the pleading in the world is not going to open it up. You know, and this was the same with the story of the flood, wasn't it? You know, it took Noah 120 years to build that ark. And the whole time, the door of the ark was wide open for everybody to come in. Noah preached for 120 years, but nobody would listen. Instead, they mocked Noah and his preaching. And then, at the last day, they came to Noah, and uh, Noah and his family entered into the ark, and the door was shut, the flood came, the water started rising, and then they started beating on the door. But it was too late. And suddenly their mockery, it wasn't so funny anymore, and uh, they were faced with the horror of their death. Jesus said, I'm the door. That's one of his... Word pictures in the Gospel of John that we'll get to eventually. I'm the door, and anybody can enter. But that door of opportunity is not going to be there when he returns. Isaiah preached something similar. He said, seek the Lord while he, might, while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. The foolish five, they were not a part of the wedding procession. They, they did not honor the bridegroom, and they were not worthy to be at the wedding feast. And if we don't honor the Lord in our life, he won't honor us in our death. Matthew 10, 32 says, Whoever acknowledges me before man, I will also acknowledge him before my Father in heaven. But whoever disowns me before men, I will disown him before my Father in heaven. Another time Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me on that last day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your 
name drive out demons and perform miracles, then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. And this, this verse, it's frightening when you read it, you know, because so many of the church, they have the appearance, but they don't have the true relationship of Jesus. And this parable states that not everyone who thinks that they know the bridegroom and thinks they're getting in will actually get in. Many will hear these words of judgment, I don't know. Jesus knows those who are his sheep and those who aren't. He knows those who have truly trusted him and depended on him and have a relationship with, with him and those that don't. This evening, what does your relationship with Jesus look like? Well, the parable ends by saying, therefore, keep watch, because you do not know the day or the hour. How do we keep watch? Does that mean that we sell everything we own and go and wait on a hill somewhere for Jesus to come back? You know, there's, there's people that actually did that. No. But it means that you need to be prepared spiritually. Make sure you're one of the five wise. Be watchful against sin. We need to be careful and watchful that our hearts aren't misguided, you know. We, we have to have regular self-examinations to see if and when sin begins to creep in our hearts. And if it does, we need to repent of it, confess our sins. And Jesus is faithful to forgive us of our sin. And just make sure unbelief hasn't started to take a foothold. Bring everything that we struggle with before the throne of grace. We need to be watchful that we're still walking in truth, that we're still grounded in the scriptures. Because God's word directs us, it guides us. It's a lamp to our feet, right? So we need to make sure that we're in the Word so that we can see where we're going. It helps us to mistrust the world and the way it thinks and to keep our focus on Jesus. We need to be watchful in our communion with God. You know, when Jesus was in the garden praying intensely before his arrest, we talked about that this morning, he, he returned to the disciples and they were sleeping. And he said to them, could you not keep watch with me for one hour? He says, watch or pray so you don't fall into temptation. He said, because the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What's our prayer time like? Are you always asleep when you're trying to do your devotions? Do you forget about it all together? Be watchful. In your communion with God. And we need to be watchful in doing things that have eternal significance. You know, not wasting our time with things that perish. Think about the things that have eternal value, like evangelism, helping people find their way to the Lord. Pray, you know, for your lack of watchfulness. That you won't be distracted from the world, by the world. And pray that the Lord will help you spend your time in things that last. Are you prepared to meet your maker this evening? Don't be discouraged that there is a delay. For he certainly is going to come again. And if you're on the right side, well, it's going to be a day of great rejoicing, great wedding feast. A great, glorious wedding. Therefore, keep watch, because we do not know the day or the hour. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your scripture and how you warn us and tell us about everything, Lord. There's, there's nothing left untold. We know you're coming back. You've told us. You've told us to get ready. You've given us parables to think about it. You've told us just plainly with your own words and all the letters in the New Testament talk about the coming of Christ and 
you talk to the apostles before you ascended to heaven about it, there's so many places where you address this issue and we can't be caught off guard if we're in the Word and we're thinking about it. So help us to be thinking about uh, your coming and being prepared and making the most of our time while we still have that time. Not only with our own personal walk, but also making good use of our time to tell everybody we know about Jesus because when he comes back, then we won't be able to share that message anymore. So let's be vigilant. Lord, help us to just... Um, do what we're supposed to be doing. Keep our eyes on you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Derek. Let's go to the Red Hand book. We sang it before this week, but it went with the sermon this evening. So we're going to sing 666. 666, Jesus is coming soon. Please stand. Salmon ceremony. Okay. Back, we 